It's hard to believe that domestic cats haven't always been part of our lives and graced our homes, whether as a farmyard mouser or simply as a kitchen companion. In fact, domestic cats were only introduced into Europe around the time of the Battle of Hastings. Since then, the household cat has departed remarkably little in behaviour from its ancestors. Unlike dogs, cats have kept their independence and still revert to the feral or wild state with very little encouragement. And of course, every self-respecting feline still retains its hunting instincts. It's often thought that the domestic cat is a descendant of the European wild cat, but this animal is quite untamable. Many have tried to keep one as a pet and failed. It seems far more likely that this domestic tabby originated from a quite different line, from the wild cat of Africa. The African wild cat certainly looks remarkably similar to the domestic tabby, though it is slightly larger. It spends most of the day resting and sleeping in the shade, behaviour familiar to all cat owners. Like most members of the cat family, it's solitary and prefers to hunt after nightfall. But wild cats do sometimes hunt during the day if the weather is cool. It often lurks in reed beds near water holes where it has a chance of creeping up on unsuspecting birds that come down to drink. It approaches using a ground-hugging run and then inches forward slowly to within striking distance of its prey. Unlike the European wildcat, the African wildcat doesn't shun man and often lives close to farms and villages. Over 4,000 years ago, the ancient Egyptians bred from the ancestors of this wildcat population to produce the domestic cat that we know today. In ancient Egypt, cats became objects of a passionate cult and were held sacred to Bast, the goddess of pleasure and fertility. At the death of a cat, the entire household went into mourning and the small corpse was embalmed and carried to the temple of Bast. Cats were considered so sacred that the Egyptians often risked their own lives to rescue a cat from danger. The practice of cat worship has perished alongside the Egyptians but we still delight in the domestic cat. But the feline hunters of Africa that people consider most typical are the lions. Lions are unique in many ways. They're the most social of all the cats. The male's chief role in the pride is to defend the territory and females from other males. In lions, as in all cats, the female is smaller than the male. Male lions use their extra bulk to oust the females from a carcass. It's suggested that the mane gives the male the appearance of daunting size and strength without the drawbacks of increased weight. A lion pride usually consists of about 10 adult females, their offspring, and about four males. Lions certainly resemble other cats in spending most of the day resting together in the shade. The core of the pride consists of about four closely related females which grew up together within it. The breeding males within the pride are also related and probably arrived as a bachelor group a few years ago and took over the pride by force. A lioness will often allow another female's cub to suckle from her this is almost unheard of among most other mammals, where the mother is extremely intolerant of another female's offspring. But as these cubs are the offspring of a close relation, the lioness is feeding cubs that still carry many genes identical to her own. 
It's rather like an aunt bringing up her nephews and nieces. The lionesses breed throughout the year and the cubs within each litter continue to suckle until they're six months old. By the time the cubs are two years old, the lioness produces her next litter. The older cubs will be able to feed themselves at the carcass by then. In this way, the cubs within a lion pride always have plenty of companions and older brothers and sisters as playmates. It's believed that the spots on the cub's coats indicate a distant ancestor in common with the leopard, probably a small forest-dwelling creature which followed its prey out onto the plains during the rise of the ungulate herds. It's the female that makes most of the kills within a pride. Perhaps the lion's mane makes him too conspicuous. Lions are most successful when hunting upwind, but in common with most cats, sight is more important to lions than smell. When several lions hunt together, they often fan out to encircle the prey, cutting off possible escape routes. Water holes are favourite places for an ambush. Though lions can reach a maximum of 35 miles an hour, their prey is usually much faster so lions must use stealth to approach within a hundred feet of their prey. From that distance they can charge and pounce before it outruns them. Waiting for the right moment may take many hours. The lionesses must be patient. But an inexperienced male charges out too soon and the setup is spoiled for the waiting lionesses. But they will continue to hunt from this waterhole. The bulk of the lion's prey consists of the larger antelope, wildebeest and zebra. During the dry season, these animals migrate to areas where the rain can be expected to bring fresh new growth. The lion pride is trapped within its territory and can't follow the herds as they leave its hunting range for better pastures. During periods of severe drought, this can produce quite devastating results in the resident pride. There are no cubs. They were the first to fall victim to starvation, and the females will soon follow, unable to compete with the larger males for what little game remains. In contrast, a female cheetah often includes the annual migration routes of her prey within her home range, though her movements are restricted while she's bringing up her cubs. Like most other cats, female cheetahs are solitary and bring up their cubs unaided. During the first six weeks, they remain hidden in the grass. By about three months, the cubs are fully weaned and follow their mother on hunts. They've already learned to wait, patiently hidden in the scrub, while she searches for Impala or Thompson's gazelle. She watches the herd attentively before beginning to stalk. The cheetah is well adapted for her distinct method of hunting. 
The slender build and flexible spine enable her to take astonishingly long and rapid strides. Permanently bared claws give extra purchase like spiked running shoes. Unlike the lion, she can outrun her prey. Though able to reach 60 miles an hour, the cheetah lacks stamina and she must catch up with her prey within a few hundred yards or give up the chase. Cheetahs, especially females with cubs to feed, make almost twice as many successful kills as lions or leopards. Cheetahs are able to maintain a relentless hold on their suffocating prey while breathing through enlarged nasal passages themselves. They often lose their prey to other predators, and however exhausted, they'll always try to drag the carcass to a safe hiding place. She allows the cubs first access to the carcass while she keeps a wary eye open for scavengers. Unlike lions, cheetahs never return to a carcass, so they must gorge themselves at one sitting. Luckily, this time, no other predator appears on the scene and they can feed in peace. Lions and cheetahs may occasionally climb up into the branches of a tree for a better view of the surrounding countryside, but the leopard is the only large African cat to feel truly at home there. It has a rather macabre habit of dragging all its kills up into the canopy of a favourite tree and draping them over the convenient branches so that the tree forms a cool, leafy larder. In this way, the leopard can return to feed on a carcass whenever it likes, as it's well beyond the reach of other predators and scavengers. The leopard normally preys on small antelope and birds, though it does sometimes include another feline relation in its diet, the serval. The serval is less nocturnal than the African wildcat and often prowls around in broad daylight. These kittens are practicing their hunting skills. The serval seems to have an extremely long neck and legs in proportion to its size, it needs the extra height when hunting small rodents and lizards which lurk beneath the grass stems. It often pauses for a few seconds and tenses, listening for a faint rustle in the grass before making an elastic leap in its direction. This is unusual among cats, where sight normally dominates over hearing. Small cats are particularly sensitive to high frequency sounds such as rustles and squeaks. All cats use their ears for communication with one another as well as hearing, but none can match up to the caracal, 
whose ears have evolved into an exquisite mobile signalling device, topped by two-inch-long black tassels. Even the name of the species derives from a Turkish word meaning black ear. Like the leopard, the caracal climbs well and sometimes carries its kill up into the branches of a tree where it can feed undisturbed. But it never stores food as the leopard does. It prefers dry scrub and acacia woodland and gives way to the serval cat in all areas where there's tall grass for most of the year. In Africa, the caracal also lives around the margins of the Sahara and in the Kalahari Desert. It's sometimes known as the desert lynx, though it's smaller than a lynx with a long, slender body. Like the wild cat, it will sometimes hunt by day in cool weather, and it's renowned for its ability to strike birds down in mid-flight, sometimes leaping six feet into the air. In order to avoid confrontation with lions, which sleep during the hottest part of the day, the cheetah often makes its kills around mid-morning or early afternoon. But unfortunately for her, this overlaps with the period when vultures are fully active and soaring on daytime thermals. If she's made her kill in the open grasslands, it'll soon be spotted by the aerial scavengers. A handful of vultures are unable to drive a cheetah off its carcass, but a solid phalanx of waiting figures is more disturbing to a cheetah, which is the most nervous and timid of the African cats. The vultures have attracted the attention of other scavengers, such as jackals, which hang about on the fringes looking for a chance to run in and steal a morsel from the carcass. The female and her cub put on a brave attempt to defend their hard-won spoils. But while their attention is distracted by the jackal, the vultures see their chance to move in. The cheetahs have no hope against a mob like this. Finally, they give up and leave the vultures to crowd in on the carcass in a shrieking mass. This is the main reason why cheetahs have to make so many more successful kills than lions or leopards. They have to compensate for the regularity with which they're driven from their kill before they even have time to swallow a few mouthfuls. There'll be nothing worth returning to here once the vultures have finished squabbling over the spoils. The cheetahs move off to rest in the shade. It'll probably be many hours before the female will attempt to make another kill. So far, every African cat we've seen has been a hunter of the plains. But some small cats, such as the elusive golden cat, choose to live in remote forests, emerging only at night to hunt tree hyraxes and rodents. The golden cat is about twice the size of a domestic cat, but is considerably more powerful and can bring down small dica or pygmy antelope. It often shares its habitat and prey with the leopard. The leopard also relies on cover. It needs to find shade during the heat of the day. Leopard cubs are vulnerable to attack from lions, hyenas and baboons. They spend most of their time in hiding, waiting for their mother to return from a kill. When she returns, the long hours of inactivity are punctuated by explorative forays into the undergrowth, though they're never out of their mother's watchful gaze. Like cheetahs, the female leopard brings up the cubs entirely on her own. Her coat blends in perfectly among the dappled leaves and shadows. In fact, there's a great deal of variation in the leopard coat colour, 
ranging from pure black to stripes. No two leopards share the same pattern of spots. Leopards lack speed and stamina, so they prefer to hunt in thick cover. Once camouflaged against the leaves, the leopard melts into the background and becomes invisible to its prey. Though most leopard kills take place at dawn or dusk, occasionally the perfect chance presents itself during the day. The leopard is renowned for her stealth. She glides forward in absolute silence, each footfall muffled by the soft pads on her feet and the sheathed claws. Still unaware of any danger, the Dick Dick continues browsing on fallen seed pods. Meanwhile, the leopard has discovered the perfect place from which to launch her attack. Tensing herself, a slight rustle betrays her presence. A warning bark of alarm, but it comes too late. She strikes with claws extended, followed by an accurate bite to the back of the neck. Her next concern is to find a safe place to conceal herself and her booty. A deep crevice among the boulders provides her with the perfect retreat. The leopard, in common with all other cats, is believed to have had small beginnings. It's thought that all cats evolved from an animal similar to the genet over 50 million years ago. The genet is placed in the mongoose family, although it has so many feline characteristics that it's often referred to as the genet cat. It shares the slender build, binocular vision and retractile claws with the cat family, and stalks rodents, birds and insects like a cat. Perhaps all modern cats owe their feline origins to an ancestor very like the genet. But the future of today's African cats is not so certain. The continuing destruction of woodland by elephants is driving the leopard into decline and the cheetah, which once included India in its range, is now restricted to a few small pockets in Africa as more of its savannas are turned over to agriculture.